You have probably experienced this and will all be experiencing it more as a society ages. A family member or friend is released from hospital, needs further care, care that often you end up providing. Of course, that often means putting aside your own needs, sometimes to the detriment of yourself and everyone else involved. Tonight, we shine the spotlight on the caregiver. Then, as part of our continuing look back at 10 seasons of the agenda, a conversation about language, labels, identity, and why words matter when diagnosing and treating mental illness. Targeting treatment, that's tonight on the agenda. Funding for the Agenda with Steve Pagan is provided by Ontario's more than 80,000 chartered professional accountants. Public policy leaders since 1879. More information is available at cpaontario.ca. And by contributions to TVO by viewers like you. Thank you. When patients are released from hospital to outside care, 80% of that care is actually provided informally by family and friends. That can be an incredibly challenging and stressful job. And the long hours spent looking after ailing family members means that all too often, the health and well-being of the caregiver goes ignored. Here to address the so-called invisible patient, we welcome Dr. Samir Sinha, Director of Geriatrics for Mount Sinai Hospital and the University Health Network Hospitals and the Provincial Lead for Ontario's Senior Strategy. Kerry Kaluski, Scientist at the Lunenfeld Tannenbaum Research Institute in the Sinai Health System. Kathy Kastner, Health Blogger at BestEndings.com and an educator with a focus on end-of-life issues. And Wendy Wu, retired IT specialist, now one of those invisible patients, caring for a family member at home. And it's good to welcome uh, all of you to TVO. Some of you welcome back. Some of you, you've never been here before? That shocks me. You haven't been here before? You haven't been here before? You've been here before. You could co-host, you've been here so often. No. Anyway, <laughs> let's read this. This is from the Canadian Caregiver Coalition. There are at least 8.1 million Canadians, or 28% of Canadians, providing care to a family member or friend with a long-term health condition, disability, or aging needs. They contribute 25 to $26 billion in unpaid labor to our health care system. 6.1 million people who provide informal care for others have jobs, accounting for more than a third of Canada's workforce. Their caregiving responsibilities amount to $1.3 billion in lost productivity per year. Some of the numbers of this issue. Dr. Kay, I want you to start us off. Give us a snapshot about who we're talking about here when we talk about informal caregivers, or as we've talked about it, the invisible patient. Right, so it's really important to emphasize that informal caregivers are a very, very diverse group. So we often hear about people caring for their partners and spouses, uh, caring for their parents, but you also have grandchildren, for example, caring for their grandparents. You have people caring for their children who are medically complex. And a lot of these people have to make decisions between time spent at work and also time spent caregiving. So we call these people the sandwich generation. So there's more and more people that are falling to that category where they have to make a, a number of trade-offs in terms of how do they look after their children and financially support their children, but also look after their parents in need. And so I think it's really important to understand that it's a very, very diverse group, and it's important to understand everyone within their context, because I think their, their experiences will be very different based on the type of care that they're providing. Before I go on to Dr. S, I am having a moment of panic here. Mm -hmm. I love to pronounce everybody's names perfectly, and I fear I did not. You're Kaluski, yes. not Kaluski? Yes, Kaluski. Kaluski. You got it. Good. Okay, yep. glad we got that People done. People usually get it wrong, but you got it right. <laughs> I got it right the second time. If I was so good, I would have got it right the first time. <laughs> Dr. S., when you talk about the health of these caregivers being at risk, what kinds of things are you seeing? You know, a, a lot of it's related to the fact that it's just the stress of making those trade-offs. So people have to make decisions about work. You know, do I go in today? If something happens, I have to miss work. In fact, when we think about the 6 million working caregivers in Canada, we know that amounts to 18 million missed days of work a year. I mean, this is a significant amount when we talk about that 1.3 billion of lost productivity. So if you just think about, you know, mom had an issue today or I couldn't get, uh, the, the nurse didn't appear today or was sick so they couldn't care for my, for my child, I mean, that's stressful and, and that stress can mean you know it just that you're worried 
um, that you may become depressed, uh, you may have high blood pressure, uh, and if you have your own health issues, um, heart problems, other problems, all of that can be worsened. So it really is, you know, when you actually think about working caregivers, 20% of them have significant health and emotional issues that they're, they're dealing with. We have one of them here. Wendy, we, we're grateful you're here, and we also want to say, you know, while we're going to be asking you some personal questions, feel free to, uh, you know, just tell me none of your damn business at some point <laughs> if you don't want to, to answer that. But, but you're living this, I gather, yes? Yes. What's your situation like? So in my case, my husband is the only child in the family, in, in my in-law's case. Um, my in-laws are both 90 years old. My mother-in-law was diagnosed with dementia about four or five years ago. So being the only child, we decided to renovate our home, so have a separate living quarter so they can live with us. My husband's still working right now, and I decided to retire. Um, From your bank IT job? Right, uh, about mid of 2013. So that you could take care of your mother-in-law? No, that wasn't the plan. That wasn't the plan, <laughs> no, okay. No. But I thought, yeah, I do know she was sick and they do need support, but I thought, you know, having done a full-time job and uh, I should be able to manage I know it's difficult but I thought I should be able to manage it and what happened so uh, when they moved in with that at, at the time when you were working I didn't learn much about dementia although she, we knew she had dementia so when they lived with us and I really have a close-up view so uh, from frequently forgetting their medication forgetting their meals whether they ate or not to burning food all the time and forgetting even medical appointments. So I end up reacting to all these problems. You go into problem solving mode. So mm -hmm. you, okay, so I took over the cooking. Now I took over the shopping. I took over arranging their uh, day program and they're driving them to exercise and picking them up. So my chore just went more and more and more without knowing that it actually became, I became a primary caregiver. Did this have an impact on your health? Absolutely. So, especially when my father was very ill too by end of 2013, and he passed away mid-2014. Hmm. During that time, my blood sugar just went going up and not able to come down, and I did everything the doctor said. So I went, finally took the time to see my doctor. She said, ooh, you're under stress. I said, hmm, I quit. I retired. How can I be under stress? So I actually was sent to work with a social worker, and I realized I was under stress, and uh, my body was just giving these warning signs that, you know, hey, it, it's, it's enough. You've got to take care of your own health, too. Hmm. So, Kathy, what's your experience with this? Well, my parents are long gone, but when my mom, um, it took a very long time to get my mother diagnosed, who finally d died of a brain tumor which mimicked um, dementia symptoms. I fled. I have brother and sister, and I could, I was not, absolutely not up to Wendy's challenge. And um, be that as it may, you know, I, whenever I could, I got out of trying to take care of her and do all the daily tasks, which grew exponentially. You know, it's not just the doctor's appointments. It is the lifting of someone to the bathroom. It is the learning how to prevent bed sores. It's the medical training that you have, but I don't have. We had to take care of all of that as caregivers do. I wanted no part of that. So I fled, but it didn't mean um, it didn't affect my health. And at a certain point, my brother and sister, who are just wonderful, said, you got to get out of here. you got to take a vacation because you're useless to us <laughs> at the moment. <laughs> and um, that's um, how I ended up coping. Now, because, you know, I think not everybody rises to the task. And I think the... the the guilt and the ramifications of not doing what you are expected to do as a son, as a daughter, as a parent, are equally awful to, if that's the right word, to those who do uh, take part in everything that you're talking about. So I think about that regularly and even more so now, although the, you know they've been gone a long time, but I'm now immersed in trying to identify areas between caregivers and healthcare professionals mm -hmm. that get missed. Hmm. Simple things, like sex. Okay, sex may not be a simple thing, but often caregivers and the patients long for 
comfort. Human go, contact. Yeah. Human contact. And it's a taboo subject that's not talked about with healthcare professionals often. Mm -hmm. So I have a completely different view now of thinking how my mom would have loved me to have climbed into the hospital bed with her and given her a hug. Yeah. There was nothing doing. First of, first of all, um, that's very candid of you to admit, so thank you for acknowledging that. How, how have you dealt over the years, and, and I wonder whether there has been associated stress, with dealing with the guilt? Because I can imagine your siblings might have at some point said, what gives here? In not as gentle terms as that, but yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, absolutely, but you know, um, for whatever selfish reasons, and they certainly were, my choice was, and this was after a fair bit of deliberation, there's a, there's a plate in my kitchen that says, if mama ain't happy, ain't nobody happy. <laughs> that was my thought. I have to actually take care of myself if I'm going to be of any use to anybody else. Not that this was a popular thought with my brother and sister, but um, I did. I had to reconcile that with myself. And to this day, she died a long time ago. It is still a topic that comes up that I have to excuse myself for and ask for forgiveness for, and I understand that. They took up a lot of the slack. And you know, she was an un even without dementia, and I don't doubt this happens across the board with those who are ill. She was unpredictable. The, the, the um, fight for whose autonomy was going to be respected. Was it going to be ours? Was it going to be hers? She was not to be treated as a child. You know, this whole parenting, the parent things, you absolutely having none of that. So there are complications with um, um, parenting a spouse or a ch an adult child uh, taking care of their, their parent. Let me see if I can, because uh, you, you make house calls, right? You're absolutely. a doctor who makes house calls. Yeah. Now, when you go to somebody's home and you see clearly who the, who the patient is, but then you also see perhaps some stress among the offspring who are either competing or not involved in the care thereof. Do you get involved in that dynamic? And if so, what do you do? Well, it's, as a geriatrician, I feel it's, it's my obligation to get involved in that dynamic and understand that dynamic. And it happens in my office, it happens in the hospital, it also happens in the home. In the home, it's very obvious because you're often there with, you know, the caregiving uh, aspects. I mean, one of the things is we always t sometimes use this term informal caregivers. And I think a lot of caregivers have come up and said, as you just heard from our, our two caregivers here, there's nothing informal about what I do. It's actually quite formal. It might be doing feeding tubes, it might be starting IVs, it may be doing very technical tasks that you know common professionals do. But it's also that, that emotional struggle. It's about understanding about how are they coping, how are they doing. And it's just the smallest thing that I think a lot of us should do more in terms of not only addressing our patients, but then also looking to who the identified caregivers be, which a growing in a growing number of cases now are actually not even blood relatives. It could be next door neighbors, it could be friends, it could be other people, especially when families are becoming much more um, spread out across the country, for example, or you may outlive your family and friends. Mm -hmm. So I think the really the most important thing I can do or I've learned to do is to identify who that caregiver is, invite them into the meeting when, when the patient will, will allow that, and always make sure that I take time to say, and how are you doing? Mm -hmm. And just shut up for a second. And when you ask them, how, how are you doing, what do you tend to hear back? Um, sometimes it's tears. You know, sometimes it's, I'm doing okay but thanks for asking. And often it's, uh, I'm not sure where to start. And I think this is when you hear those gaps. This is when you hear the, nobody taught me about this or that. And that's when we can really be helpful about saying, do we need to connect you with a social worker? Do we need to connect you with a home care coordinator? Do we need to get your health under control? Now, we have one example here, Dr. K, of uh, blood sugar rising. I don't know, did you become a diabetic? I hope not. I'm on the borderline right You're now. On the I've borderline. learned to manage it, but okay. still. Okay, well, let's hope it doesn't happen. But mm -hmm. what kind of stuff do you hear back from people saying, you know, I'm so neck deep in caring for this person, here's what's happened to my health? Yeah, so we often hear, I'm a researcher, so I look a lot at the literature, and I actually collect patient and caregiver experiences to hear about what it's like for them in the healthcare system. So they talk a lot about feeling a lot of stress, a bit of depression, um, feeling anxious, and feeling guilty sometimes about not, you know, doing what they feel they should be doing. But you also hear about, you know, them potentially becoming patients in the healthcare system as well because of high blood pressure and other health issues. But on the contrary, 
story, we tend to see a lot of negative stuff in the literature, but there's also positive aspects of caregiving too. Like what? So when I, when I talk to caregivers, they often say, you know, it's really busy. It's like having a full-time job, but you have these moments, you know, with your parent or your child or with your partner, and you think, this is bringing us closer together. We're working through a lot of trials and tribulations, and there's something so valuable about that, that they, they capture those moments and feel, okay, this is why I'm doing what I'm doing. But then suddenly it's overtaken by maybe a health exacerbation, they're back into the hospital and they're dealing with a really complex, fragmented healthcare system. But they often talk about kind of moving back and forth between the positive appreciation, feeling closer together, but also feeling the stresses and strains of being a caregiver and navigating a system that's really impossible to navigate. But I wonder whether the compensation for being the one person who can help this sick relative or friend out of the trauma that they're in, mm -hmm. um, you know, if you get sick yourself, as exactly. wonderful as that feeling may be, it's not going to compensate, is it? Right, but I think a lot of people are embedded within networks as well. So it's not just one person who's providing that care. It could be a neighborhood. It could be other siblings that are trading off responsibilities. And I think to a certain extent, that's what keeps people sane. So my mom's a caregiver, for example. So she goes on vacation, then my uncle steps in. You know, they kind of trade off and they're able to sort of manage because they work together on that. But, gotcha. but I think as, when we look at caregivers, we have to look at the system and the network within which they're embedded to really assess that and try to leverage that. To that end, here's something from a recent study by Health Quality Ontario, which measures how we're doing, and they have found, this reported in the Globe and Mail last October, they have found that almost all long-term home care patients in the province rely on the help of family and friends for emotional comfort, as well as for routine tasks such as grocery shopping, transportation, managing medication, personal care, things we've talked about here. But one in three primary caregivers reported last year feeling distressed, angry, or depressed or said they were unable to continue providing that support, and that is up from slightly less than 16% in 2010. Mm -hmm. Do you know why we're seeing a rise in this, Dr. K? I think what's interesting is if you look at what's included in professional home care baskets, there's a lot of focus on support for activities of daily living. So that's sort of the heavy lifting, the toileting, the personal hygiene, and the eating. What's been stripped out over the years, decades and decades, is taking out what seems to be really simple things, like instrumental activities of daily living, managing medications, shoveling the driveway, going to appointments, trying to navigate amongst all the different providers in the system. So I think as that gets stripped out, more and more of those time-consuming tasks Get, gets put onto caregivers and if they're still working and trying to navigate the system at the same time and still managing the household and the finances and the housing of the people they're looking after becomes really really complicated. And Dr. So. S when the caregiver can no longer give care what happens then? Well you know all of a sudden they give up you know and they they come to the hospital with their loved one and they say I can't do this anymore and and then they're ending up in a long-term care home which actually costs us four times the amount that it does to provide them care you know care at home. So one of the issues when we're reviewing home care in this province you know with you know with our report for the minister is we heard so much from caregivers who said when I'm being assessed or when we're being assessed for home care they're thinking about the care recipient they're sometimes forgetting about my needs in terms of respite services or they're just even forgetting to ask that basic question that I've learned to ask is and how are you doing and what do you need because sometimes it's just the you know I don't really I'll bathe mom that's fine and she, actually she prefers to be bathed by me but could I get those three hours a week on Friday mornings so I can just have three hours to myself to go for a walk and maybe get my hair cut or whatever it is it's understanding what they need can often be that trade-off between them collapsing and saying I can't do this let me find that out from Wendy have, have you ever during the drama that you are living now gone to your husband and said I can't do this anymore yes many times <laughs> yeah, many times okay and what happens then I think then we all realize there's no place to go because we're the only source of support. You're the so, last line of defense here. Right. So we even tried to, uh, the respite wasn't available as far as time goes. We went away for a few days and then there was drama at home. They got to the hospital and we rushed home. Um, we realize now we cannot go sep on vacation together, so we have to take separate vacations. You and your husband? Yes. You cannot vacation together? No. Because someone's got to be available mm -hmm. to, to deal with his parents. Them. Right. Because they, my mother-in-law now falls frequently, so it can happen any time, even mid of the night. We we will have to run over and get her in bed. So this case, we you know really would be appreciated if the respite service is available for us, and we could travel for a few days just so we can have a peace of mind and knowing they're safe. Have you tried, or can you put together, like Team Wendy? 
other people, other friends, other family who could give you a break and join in the effort? We did, and I, I know we have PSW. I hire some private help too. Um, but the problem is she's at the point of anything that even PSW cannot get her to eat. So I'm the first line of support. Hmm. They would just call me. So, oh, right. Wendy, you know, I can't get you and mom to eat. She doesn't even take her medication. Does she still live with you? Yes. I presume you've had this conversation with your husband, but, uh, you know, is it time to put mom in a, in a long-term care facility? Have you had that conversation? It's, it's in our culture, is not thinkable. It's unthinkable to put our parents in there because um, he's the only child, so there's nobody to share with. And one time I did, because my mother-in-law had a serious fall, had eight stitches on her skull just two months ago. So I ended up having that conversation with my father-in-law, say there's, the doctor is saying it's inevitable. And I could see he was in tears. He really could not cope with it. He does not want to talk about it. He does not want to think about it. And he's 90 years old, so I don't have the heart to really push for that conversation. Hmm. So it is draining, as you said. It's, it's very difficult. I wish I'm more equipped to have that dialogue, but I'm not. What's your reaction? What do you do here? Well, one of the <clears throat> solutions that I found, and this is not I, who am not, because I'm not taking care of anybody right now, um, is the internet. Online communities at 3 o'clock in the morning when you are desperate for human contact, desperate to talk about something other than the way your world has gotten smaller and smaller and just revolves around the health issue of the person that you are taking care so there, of. So there, there is an online world of caregivers. Many, many caregivers. There's a, a robust Twitter community. I know everybody rolls their eyes because it's only 140 characters, but there are elder care um, caregivers who gather and swap jokes. You know, they do. We, it's a relief. What? Do you, want, do, do you remember any? Yeah. <laughs> you want to tell any, one? Any of the jokes? Yeah. Well, most of them are dirty, so we'll just have to wait until afterwards. But I'll <laughs> be happy to share any of them afterwards. <laughs> uh, but, but the point being that when your life revolves just around the day-to-day -day minutia, as it were, then that can become, as you all know, not only burdensome, but then you you're not interesting anymore. You have nothing to talk to even your coworkers about. Mm -hmm. And for whatever it's worth, I have found it does not matter how much money you have. There's many an executive's office that I've been in who is waiting for that phone call saying there's something going on with your mother. And they can well afford all of the care that's needed. And the stress level does not go down just because you got a bunch of dough. It's, it's what you were talking about with PSWs, Wendy, that at a certain point, which of us wants to have someone other than someone we love or loves us taking care of us? Mm. You know, it's a, it's, a, it's a human thing. And people who have otherwise had successful lives and careers, and all of a sudden, you're feeling so crummy that you can't get up and go to the bathroom by yourself. How demeaning is that for the person that's being cared for? Mm. So what a tough situation for both people to be in. And that is why, silly as it sounds, the internet, with its groups, with its sympathetic ear, with its availability 24-7. There's lots of times when I hear that the elderly can't afford. So my, my demographic is adult children caring for aging parents with some grandchildren mixed in there. That they can't afford the internet. So the caregiver and the elderly person, or the care is cut off by a simple, as it were, act of not being able to access Hmm. access the world out there. And oh. I mean, we, we all know, and I'm not talking about Dr. Google that we, you know, we, we probably all go to, but I think it is an underappreciated, underutilized resource, mm -hmm. that um, connectivity, that virtual connectivity. Let me ask you to sort of get through this labyrinth here for us. Here's an example of uh, first of all, you're very brave to come in here today and share your personal story with us. So thank you very much, because it's helpful. You know, there's lots of thousands of other people watching us right now who are in the same shoes as you, and they don't know what to do about it. She talked about the cultural angle here. Absolutely. How, wh what do you do when your culture says, under no circumstances whatsoever, 
are we to put mom or dad, quote unquote, in a home. But, you know, she's kind of run up against the end of what she's able to do herself. What do you do here? And this is, this is a challenge. I've had some patients, you know, from, from different cultures but have that, that similar background where I had one who said, you know, you're Indian, aren't you? And I said, yeah. She said, you know our cultures, we don't even talk about that. You know, that, that's not even an option. I said, well, no, we need to have a talk about this, right? And I think it's about challenging those, those norms. Um, many years ago in Britain, there was a groundbreaking report called They Look After Their Own, Don't They? So that assumption that, oh, you're Asian mm -hmm. or you're, you're, you're Spanish and, or you're from a, you're, you're Greek or Portuguese, don't you, that's what, you, you know, you look after and you do not put grandma or mom or dad in a nursing home. But what I, you know, what I think the key is that we have to make those assumptions, we have to challenge those assumptions that we're not dealing in the same cultural context that we may have grown up in, mm -hmm. um, and that there are different circumstances. We don't have large extended families, perhaps, that can make those other options more uh, of not having a loved one go to a long-term care home. And so this is where it's, it's making sure that caregivers understand what the options are and why it's important for them to think about their health um, and how they can be better supported. So if they don't have the internet, the Alzheimer's Society has wonderful um, telephone support programs. Um, they also have wonderful, you know, in-person support groups. Um, and then by negotiating and making sure people understand about respite services, or even when long-term care is not necessarily a bad thing, I've had a lot of those families in those cultural contexts who come back and say, you were so right, because now that mom is in that home nearby, I can concentrate on going every day and just sitting there and laughing with her. I can go and feed her, I can do those things, but I can be her daughter again. Mm -hmm. and, I think that, that, and I think that's the part that we have to really be careful about, not making assumptions, but challenging assumptions when it's appropriate and making sure people know their options. Dr. Kay, I'm going to read this here from the Conference Board of Canada. I'll give you the first kick at commenting on it. Mm -hmm. Sheldon, I'm at the top of page five, please. Between 2011 and 2026, Canadian seniors requiring paid and unpaid continuing care supports is projected to increase by 71%. The reliance on unpaid caregivers and volunteers to provide continuing care supports will grow dramatically. What policies does the province have to act on to meet this remarkable challenge yeah, coming, down the, coming challenge, down the road? It's a huge challenge, and I think historically what we have, we've had policies in place that kind of dictate what happens to people. So we know that caregivers are the backbone of our system. You know, 26 billion to 40 billion per year is, you know, provided by unpaid caregivers. So as a researcher, I say, why don't we bring them to the decision making table? Why don't we ask them, what do you need? What can we leverage from your communities? And let's move away from this traditional informal caregiver definition to social support networks, community support services, respite services. How do we leverage that? Bring everyone around the table to say, what is your experience? What do you need from a, not a health care system, a health system? And I say that to emphasize the social determinants of health just as much as health care. So I think if we start to be really creative in terms of how we start to design services to really respond to the needs of this growing population, we can minimize waste. There's a lot of dollars put towards things that people frankly don't really want. You know, so if we start to leverage, you know, resources in a different way and be creative, I think we can do a lot, even with the shrinking base. Let's do it right here. Wendy, what do you need? <laughs> <laughs> Increased beds, but no, I think it's, uh, I think you're quite right, because I think as caregiver, we love our family, and I've been volunteering at Yihong, and uh, one of the things, for example, very recently, I was in their training session for play intervention for dementia. And that was, uh, I think Dr. Tan from U of T was the founder of this uh, program. Uh, what I find is a, is a training, it trained me to how do I spend time with my mother-in-law and seize that little moment of happiness. So I now try to play with her after dinner by simple things. And so I, I think we need a little more support, a little more education and having a, 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 the right dialogue with them, the, even the difficult dialogue of moving to senior homes. I think we need the education to, to, to be that you know, voice that we can, we'll be brave enough to have like dialogue with the, uh, with the patient. Okay, I'm going to ask you one of those personal questions now that you're free to dodge if you want to. <laughs> is, is your husband helpful? Uh, yes, because I do the day shift, he does the night shift. <laughs> Meaning if anything happens overnight, 
It's, it's, it's on him. Yes. So he is helpful. Yes. Although I noticed you paused before you answered. Because mm -hmm. I think it's uh, it's difficult. The father son relationship isn't the best because it's difficult to have some of the dialogue. So. Uh, mm -hmm. At times, I become the conduit of the communication, mm -hmm. and I wish it's a little less like that because hmm. it should be uh, more peaceful. But it's difficult. Do I have to state the obvious here? But I presume most of the burden of all of this falls disproportionately on women than men. Yes, let me just say that. Yeah. Speaking for all women, yeah. but I would also like to. Um, talk further about something you have both said, both the women here have said, and that is bringing in um, things that both the caregiver, informal and formal, can enjoy so that it makes both lives more meaningful, whether it's arts or clowning or music mm -hmm. or um, painting or looking at a picture that there are benefits beyond the medicalization of what we're doing mm -hmm. that can sh hope maybe shift costs, shift burdens that are, are not properly looked at, in my opinion, but that can make a huge psychological difference in um, being able to cope with what's going on. I mean, imagine the joy of having um, the art gallery come and bring uh, pictures to, to wherever, or animals. I'm a dog lover. I intend to have dog pets right up until the day that I die. And I think, you know, there are therapy animals that, uh, that come into places that can be beneficial for everyone. Therapy animals. Indeed. Meaning they just show up at the time when you need somebody to be happy and you don't have to deal with the picking up the poop and all the rest. That's exactly right. They oh. kind of go, oh, I love you. I love you. I love you. That's a good and deal. And that's about it, right? That's Isn't it? Deal. I want one of them hmm. now. Okay, we've got about four minutes left here. Let's just get some, let's, let's get down to brass tacks here. Some very basic advice. If you're a person watching this program right now who's in this situation, where do they start? What do you do? You know, if you're, if you're a person who's caregiving and you feel that you're under stress or you're not sure where to go, um, if you're caring for a loved one with dementia, call the Alzheimer's Society. They're actually equipped and funded by the province to actually provide resources, links and supports. But also, one thing we found when we were doing the senior strategy was 40% of caregivers, when we surveyed 1,000 across Ontario, said they didn't even know what the local home care agencies were hmm. or what services they provided. And we talked really about caregivers caring in the dark. So really reach out through your, through your primary care provider or through the local home care agency, uh, your community agency, and just say, I'm a caregiver. What are the things that are available for me? I presume one of the greatest assets as a caregiver you could hope to have would be an understanding employer. How often do we see that? Not often enough. And one of the things when we were working over the last few years on the development of an Ontario caregiver strategy or saying what should we do is one of the top three things we said other than better financial supports for caregivers, recognizing the financial burdens, recognizing that when we're providing home care, we can't just think about the care recipient but also the caregiver. Mm -hmm. But the other key thing was that our employers need to do a better job of recognizing and supporting their caregivers. And there are great employers out there doing it. And the reason why they need to do it it's an economic productivity issue. Mm. Because if I'm supporting that executive of mine, if I'm supporting that frontline worker, when we're talking about 18 million days of missed work last year in Canada because of unpaid caregiving duties coming into conflict, imagine if those 18 million days were filled with people there at their desks or on the front lines doing their things. So even the smarter employers now are realizing if they do better for their caregivers, their working caregivers, they actually do better for their bottom lines. Dr. Kay, what would you add to that? I would say we are already asking caregivers to do a lot. So I'm going to, you know, a call to action, policy planners and researchers to bring caregivers to the table, particularly the ones that don't have a voice, the ones that are marginalized, the ones that haven't been part of decision making, to ask a very simple question, what is it that you need? Mm -hmm to have quality of life. And I challenge every provider who has good intentions, is very, very busy to ask that simple question and then say, what do we need to do from a system standpoint to respond to that? Are they so, so overwhelmed at the moment though that they, that, you know, just 
participating in that kind of exercise may be beyond what they're capable yeah, of doing right be, now. Yeah, it could be, I think. I think we need to create the space and the incentives to have conversations about how do we improve quality. That's a big topic on the healthcare agenda. But creating space and time for providers to come to the table to have those conversations. And of course, there's lots of examples of that already happening, but it's a lot of one-off examples. So how do we scale and spread that to make it easier for people to do what they really want to do in practice? When you, when do you think about the future? Mm -hmm. Optimistic? Pessimistic? I'm a little scared. A little scared. Yes. Yes. Understandably so. Mm -hmm. Do you think there's any way out of that fear for you right now? Um, I know it's a continuous learning curve. To me, being here, being connected with uh, this group is, is helpful. Um, I have to recognize my own limit. My sister laughed at me, say, you don't swim, so when somebody drowns, you don't jump in. Because uh, <laughs> you just create more problem for the <laughs> rescuer. Uh, so I realize I have to recognize like, my limit and ask for help. So I think sometimes you're just so ashamed, so I shouldn't be, the guilt really gets you to a point. So now I feel much better. Uh, I will ask for help. And I think staying connected with the families and friends and organizations that care about you, it really helps. Because I think through this support, uh, you can sustain your caregiver, caregiver job longer. And you can learn from this group of people online or offline or in person. And I think occasionally you get that satisfaction of you actually help someone else. So <laughs> that feeling is really nice. Kathy, last 20 seconds Thank to you. Thank you very much. because. I think what's missing from this is the what ifs. We plan for our children. You know, you anticipate they're gonna be bonking their head on the cupboard door and you put a safety latch on. Well, you can't quite do the same thing in my demographic as adult children caring for aging parents. There is a crisis reaction reaction when dealing with caregivers. And I think uh, based on my, my website that I created because people don't, often don't know what to think, what's next. And if they do, they often do not want to approach that now. We'll mm -hmm. wait till the crisis happens. And I think that does a disservice to both caregiver and caree. A really helpful program. Thanks everybody for coming on. Can we thank Wendy Wu, and we wish you well thank with you. your caregiving obligations. And uh, Dr. Carrie Kaluski whose name I hope I said right this yes, time. You got it right. Lunenfeld Tannenbaum Research <laughs> Institute. And on the other side of the table, Kathy Kastner, her website's bestendings.com, Dr. Samir Sinha, Mount Sinai Hospital, and 25 other titles we haven't got time for anymore. <laughs> Thanks so much, everybody. Thank you. Okay, moving on. Words matter, some words empower, while others stigmatize. In 2012, as part of our Mental Health Matters series, we had a conversation at Hart House at the U of T about just that, the power of language and labels when it comes to diagnosing and treating mental illness. Let's take a look back at that conversation. And now to our conversation tonight about the power of words in the treatment of mental health. And joining us for that, Jennifer Chambers. She is the coordinator of the Empowerment Council. Dr. Thomas Unger is the chief of psychiatry at North York General Hospital. Jeffrey Riome is associate professor in critical disability studies at York University. And Marianne Andaloro is mental health consumer and advocate who has bipolar disorder. It's great of all of you to spend some time with us uh, here at Heart House as we try to get a better understanding in our last broadcast here of the issues we've been talking about all week. The term mentally ill, I want to start there. Is that an appropriate term to use, Jennifer? Uh, I don't like the term. I believe it's uh, an analogy gone wild. I think it was originally formed partly to get away from the idea that people are to blame when they're struggling mentally or emotionally. Um, however, I think the over-reliance on it has led to an over-assumption about people's problems being biologically based and an overuse of pharmacy as a solution to all of people's problems. Marianne, how about you, the term mentally ill? I think there's a lot of neg negative connotation that comes with the term. There's a long, unfortunately, negative history to psychiatry. Um, as a whole, and uh, I know myself with bipolar disorder, I consider myself as having a brain disease of some, tor of some, si some type um, as a result of malfunctioning neurotransmitters in my mind creating this disorder. So you wouldn't want to be referred to as being mentally ill or having experienced mental illness. What would you prefer? I would, well, what I would prefer would be to be considered someone who has bipolar disorder specifically. And uh, I make that distinction as I often hear the reference of someone being bipolar. 
uh, and I see their, their distinction being not part of my identity, but it being a disorder itself. Gotcha. Jeffrey? You know, I don't like the term mentally ill either because it reduces someone to a biological collection of amoebae of some kind, and I think it's not a good uh, way of understanding different people's experiences. It ends up pathologizing everybody uh, with that particular term. Um, it's better to un ask people what they would like to be referred to as, I think, than imposing a term which has a history uh, that's very, very negative. It's also a term that's only been around for the last hundred years. So when you think of people's experiences of madness, historically, a term like mental illness, they wouldn't know what you're talking about. So I think um, today it, it tends to marginalize people more than it tends to include people. Now that's interesting. You use the word madness there. Mm -hmm. Is that okay to use? Uh, yes, for me. Not everybody likes it. Um, there are some people who do... Uh, I, I actually teach a course called Mad People's History, and I do use a, a discussion, and there is also uh, Ryerson, also, uh, York teaches a course, so does Ryerson, and lots of other people. There's Mad Student Society, for example, but lots of other people use the term. I've become use, using it, in, and historically I think it's a term that should be used more because it reflects the experiences that are beyond a bio, so, bio, biologically deterministic way of looking at it. There are people who have made it clear to me they don't like the term. Um, I don't like to be called mad. Um, and that's something we, we, of course, discuss and debate amongst each other. But I think for people who want to be called mad, that should be respected. And it's also, I think, very inclusive and empowering for many people. Mad is bad has been something that has happened throughout our history. Mad can also be something that's good that for people to reclaim, to understand their experience, and above all, not to be ashamed. Those of us who have had experiences, however one defines it, as either mad, mentally ill, psychiatric disability, okay. whatever term, uh, it's, it's nothing for any of us to be ashamed. So it's a way of reclaiming it. Let me get Thomas Unger on this. What do you say? You know, I, this is just a great example of just how confusing it is for providers to try to be respectful and figure out what to call these things. We have to use a name. You have to call it something. So I try not to get overly fussed about what the term is, because I don't associate that term with the person. Uh, they're just a descriptive term we're using currently uh, to describe a group of symptoms and Enable, enables us to do research and to target our treatment. So it's a communication term. It's not what I think a person is in, in terms of how I use it. Unfortunately, the term mental illness to me does cause a lot of problems, not only for the people receiving treatment, but for the providers. Because within the healthcare field of medicine, it puts us on the wrong side of the fence in terms of what's legit and real, the organic or the body stuff, and the mind stuff that they've called functional going back to Rene Descartes' splitting of things. So I think whenever you use the term mental, there's a whole bunch of associations and feelings, and everyone gets the willies, and everyone gets uncomfortable. There's all kinds of strong feeling from providers to patients to, to, to the public and misconceptions as a result. So I wouldn't mind better terminology, but the question is, what would that be? Well, let me, Marianne, let me follow up with you on this. Mm -hmm. um, there's another scary word out there, cancer. Mm -hmm. And people who've had cancer, mm -hmm. at least most of the ones I know, mm -hmm would not object to being self-described as a cancer patient. Mm -hmm. And in fact, if they've beaten it, they call themselves cancer survivors. Mm -hmm. uh, how come that's okay, but being described as somebody who's beaten mental illness or dealing with mental illness, that's not? I think in my particular case, bipolar disorder is a lifelong condition. So I'm not going to beat this. I will struggle with this illness for the rest of my life. It will not always be a struggle. There will be times I will be well. Um, but for me to say I'm a mental health consumer, and I did you know, specifically choose that to be my title, is because I don't see myself as a survivor, as I will not beat this illness. I will simply find a comfortable way to function um, while working with medication and all the other treatments that I will require. So you were, I guess, in the same way that Cam H describes the people who go there as their clients. Clients, right. As opposed to patients. Right. These words matter. Yes. Okay, let's pick up on this here. Here's the scenario. You're riding the bus, or you're on the subway, and there's somebody who's clearly agitated mm -hmm. and is making people look at their shoes or keep their nose in their books and, you know, doing everything they can to kind of ignore what's going on. Jeffrey, how should we react? Well, for, for one thing, um, don't glare at them, <laughs> which I've, you know, you can see a lot. Um, don't assume that uh, 
you're under some sort of a threat that un try to understand that someone is going th obviously going through a difficult time and uh, needs some s obviously some space some um, space or support both. both some people some people need space they need people just to stay away sometimes and some people need support. Depends on what's going on with them. So but how do we know? We're, we're obviously not trained that, clinicians well, sometimes in the subway. We don't. What do you do? Well, even trained clinicians don't often know for sure. So, and neither do those of us who have uh, been in the system. We, do, I, I can't say that I would know. In fact, I haven't, because I've, 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 like probably most people here, have experienced um, a, a scenario that you've just mentioned on the subway or bus. So, the, trying to, to basically. I understand that the person who is experiencing um, some crisis is a, a going, going through what they're going through because of something going on in their life and that we shouldn't automatically assume they should be automatically medicated. If they're going through something that obviously looks like they're going to um, self-harm themselves or harm someone else, well then obviously one should try to help them. Let me get Marianne's view on that. D d d you know, does a passenger approach the person? Do they intervene? Do they say, do you need any help? What's the best approach to take? In a moment of crisis, it's best that, in my experience anyway, that most people clear away. Um, if I did see someone that was agitated personally, I'd probably approach them and ask them if I could help them with something, um, speak to them in a very, very calm voice, um, and respect any boundaries that they may express to me. And if they may wish to, 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 for me to listen, they may wish to talk to me, or they may wish for me to back away. But either way, just, just simply respect that and offer a hand of support or encourage encouragement or help in any way I can. Jennifer, any advice? Uh, there's no magic formula. Uh, I do mm -hmm. quite a bit of work with, um, with police and I've done some training with police on through de-escalating people who are in um, emotional crisis, but uh, a lot of things people have been saying, um, pay attention to try and understand whether people need space. Sometimes people feel, they may seem aggressive, but they're actually feeling frightened. So mm. um, they, they need people to sort of keep keep away and not, not appear like they're going to approach and therefore possibly harm them. Hmm. Um, and uh, if you're really trying to engage with someone like, like the police, then uh, you need to, to make it clear that you're there to help, um, to try and understand what the person needs, to give the person, in the case of police, choices if, if possible so that they don't feel too frightened and needing to defend themselves. Um, and just generally to to try and take the person in as an individual and not over-assume things and, and not over, try and overly control the situation. Thomas, you're the chief of psychiatry at a reasonably prominent Toronto hospital. Have you ever had this happen to you when you've been out on the subway or yes? What do you do? I probably move seats, to be honest with you. Move seats. <laughs> Absolutely. I think it's normal human reaction. You don't overthink it. If somebody's obviously terribly disturbed and you're concerned, the natural reaction people will give them some space and move away. So I, I don't put on my overthinking hat. I, I act naturally and I give them space. I think that's a natural thing and I give myself space. And then you might see if it looks like they need assistance or help, you might offer it. You might go talk to the driver. Um, but there's no magic formula because you don't know what's going on. But we can't deny the fact that the, si okay, I'll medicalize it again for a moment. The symptoms of some of these brain conditions involve strange behavior or disturbed behavior, or emotionally powerful behavior. It's not like when your liver's not working, your skin goes yellow, you get belly pain. When your brain's not working right, it plays out in your sensory system. You hear things, you see things, your emotional system might go off. That's how I understand some of them. So if someone starts acting exceedingly strangely, like any normal human, I'll, I'll, human, I'll probably just back off a little bit till I see what the heck is going on here. Marianne, uh, can you understand why it would be difficult to build a stigma-free environment when one's natural fears, I guess, probably surface in these circumstances when you see somebody on a subway acting this way. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is, this is not like just having a broken leg. It looks different, doesn't it? It does, it does look different. Um, I would say, I would call the comparison to someone having hypoglycemia. So your blood sugar is really low and you're mm -hmm. feeling very angry and frustrated right now. Would we stigmatize someone like that? Probably not. Right. And I understand that, you know, in the case of, of mental health um, issues, that it can be a little bit more severe than that. But I, I do draw connections to, met, to physical medical conditions because I think mental illness falls under that. It just looks a little different hmm. in the way it plays out. Jeffrey, how about you on that? Uh, yes, I, I think it depends on, uh, again, the circumstances. But I think the, the best support f often is for uh, people who are what we now call peer support. It's a term that was come up recent, in the recent years, but I think that's uh, the most important thing. People who've been through these experiences themselves, I mean, 
I, I, I certainly, um, I think that's essential to helping people because they've been through it. Also, you have to be careful too. I was just thinking while we were talking, um, I have to also understand our relation to them. For example, a woman experiencing a great deal of stress, I think a man has to be pretty careful if he's going to approach her because maybe she's upset about something that happened to her in relation to a man. She doesn't want any man near her. So we got to think, you know, of maybe trying to be ca as careful as possible if, if there are people who have been survivors of sexual abuse, mm. you know, and so it wouldn't be a wise thing to go up and, you know, say, how are you doing? That could be, could be the, actually the last thing. Understood. So you got to be careful, to understand each circumstance and, and, you know, try to figure out where mm -hmm. the person is at and where you're, you are in relation to the person. I read some of Aaron Anderson's piece uh, from the Globe and Mail a little earlier. I want to read another one now. This is from six months ago, five months ago. In some cases, public awareness efforts may have even entrenched certain misconceptions. Stressing the genetic and biological causes of mental illness has also shored up the false belief that it cannot be successfully treated and that even patients in recovery cannot be competent employees or reliable tenants. The term mental illness has become a misleading catch-all for a range of complex and very different illnesses and disorders. And the most pernicious misconception of all shows little sign of retreat, that the majority of people with mental illness are prone to violence. That still persists. Mm -hmm. uh, let's get into this a bit. Jennifer, we have seen some and discussed on our program some uh, what by all accounts are quite wonderful public education campaigns. I know the Bell Canada $50 million campaign is a, uh, one that has received a lot of attention. I want to know whether you think those campaigns really, at the end of the day, work. Uh, it's funny, I was just having a lively discussion with marketing people on that very topic last week. Um, I, I think that, that that was a wonderful quote because it's quite correct to say that uh, the emphasis on the biological and, and genetic has actually increased prejudice, um, as it turns out, when people research uh, stigma and prejudice, discrimination, uh, because it, the more people believe that it's intrinsic to the person and unchangeable, uh, the more uh, sort of hopeless they feel about, about that person. Uh, so I think that the information that... Well, the, trouble, the trouble with there being prejudice is that people hide the fact that they themselves have struggled, right? So it's actually, uh, if people understood how widespread it was throughout society, perhaps mm -hmm. they'd better understand um, that uh, relatives and friends and co-workers are all people who've had mm -hmm. some struggles at some point in their lives. And it's only because we all hide it uh, that people don't realize that. They only think, they only see the, the people who are very, very clearly distraught. Um, and they think that that represents everybody who's ever struggled with problems. Marianne, let me get your view. Do these campaigns really work? I think that awareness, it's opening up the conversation about it. Are we sending the right message? I think time will tell. I think time will tell. Um, I don't know that the clear message of, of the, that treatment and, and recovery can be known by someone who even has a severe uh, mental illness. Hi. My question is for the psychiatrist. I don't remember your name, sorry. Thomas. Thomas. Um, you use the word strange behavior, and I found I had a reaction to that because it assumes that there's normal and proper behavior. And then there, were, there was discussion about, yes, it's a natural way to, to walk away from somebody who exhibits strange behavior, but all those things could be socially constructed, right? And so maybe instead of talking about strange behavior or natural ways of being, we could just talk about diversities of reactions, because to say that someone is exhibiting strange behavior is automatically stigmatizing. But we've heard on previous programs, that's an interesting point, let me follow up with you. Sure. We've heard on previous programs that the use of the word normal is yeah. okay. It sounds to me like you don't like it though. Well, I think um, illness is part of being normal if you want to consider mental illness and like that. Um, I consider it just mental health, but uh, I just, I, I have a problem with the way normal, how we value the word normal, as in it's the right way to be, because if you have a right way to be, then you might also have a wrong way to be. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't like that there's a wrong way to be. Okay, but you're making, and it's okay, I'm just trying yeah, yeah. to sure. kind of understand this better. You're making somebody who suffers from mental illness sound like when you call it diversity of behavior. Yes like it's somebody who's African-American or somebody who's Jewish or somebody who's from the Portuguese community or whatever. It's just another one of those I don't mean descriptors. To put it, no, well, no? no, I don't mean it that way. Okay. Like I had postpartum depression and um, I couldn't, part of it was because I couldn't sleep. I was working nights and taking care of my baby during the day and I wasn't sleeping. So I was given pills, I was told I had postpartum depression, but the reality was I couldn't get daycare. 
so I wasn't sleeping. Um, and then when I had tried to commit suicide because of this depression, um, all of a sudden from medical grounds, I was able to get the daycare spot. I didn't have to wait the two-year waiting list. And imagine that, I no longer have postpartum depression, nor did I try to kill myself. So what is normal? I don't know. Um, was it normal for me to try to kill myself? Well, apparently it's a, a way to torture people, is to, to hmm. prevent them from sleeping. So I feel I was being tortured. I didn't feel I had postpartum depression. <laughs> How are you doing now? I'm doing great. Good to hear it. Thanks. Thank you. Anybody up there want in on that? Uh, yes. Jeffrey, I, go ahead. Yeah, I, I think that's very good comment. Thanks so much. Uh, right on, actually. I'm saying to myself, right on. <laughs> um, it, it's, it's right to say people have different behaviors, and some, we, we, some of um, uh, people who behave differently, we, to automatically say everybody should behave in a certain normalized way, it's very dangerous. I mean, because we know people have, not just historically, but in contemporary times, have been uh, pathologized and have been mistreated terribly because of being, oh, they're not behaving in a, a normal middle class bourgeois way. Uh, and I'm, you know, uh, you know uh, um, and we know how that's caused people to be labeled and, and traumatized in different ways. So I think understanding people's differences in the way they, they people behave is, is, is very important. It can be very difficult. I'm not pretending it isn't in many instances, but life is, is part of understanding each other. And, and it's, it's, it also leads, by the way, to a great deal of, of, of people's abilities trying to express themselves. Some, just because we don't, just because I don't, let's just put it to myself, because I don't understand what you are saying and you're very troubled doesn't mean I have the end all and be all of knowing what's going on in your head and what you're trying to say to me. People can say things that we don't understand that still have some kind of meaning. I actually am going to say one thing that I think everybody will understand. Mm. We're out of time. Okay, there you <laughs> go. That's the end of our program. Uh, I want to thank all four of you for coming in today to Historic Heart House and helping us out with this uh, topic. We've really enjoyed uh, doing these stories this week, and we thank all of you for participating here this afternoon. And that is the agenda for Thursday, December 3rd, 2015. Tomorrow on the program, the holiday season can bring about thoughts of unity, togetherness, and the hopes of finding common ground. We'll hear from two people who tell us what can be done to break down the walls of difference and come out the other side with understanding. And we hope you can join us for that. I'm Steve Pakin. Thanks for watching TVO, for joining us online at TVO.org, and we'll see you again tomorrow. Funding for The Agenda with Steve Pakin is provided by Ontario's more than 80,000 chartered professional accountants. Public policy leaders since 1879. More information is available at cpaontario.ca. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit supporttvo.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.